100 haemophiliacs have now died from AIDS. 1,200 more are infected with the AIDS virus in Britain's worst medical disaster. So did the companies who made and sold the vital treatment contaminated with AIDS know what they were doing? memories for Alan White. The treatment designed to ease his life will now end it. What should have carried hope carried AIDS and Alan is now dying. I'm slowly going downhill. Um, uh, <clears throat> I wound up with pneumonia a few years ago which was the major indication of full-blown AIDS uh, and all the inherent problems of pneumonia. Um, and it's just one long battle against various bugs and viruses that most people shake off in a day. Uh, can leave me literally in bed for three, four, five weeks. Like all victims of haemophilia, Alan's blood won't clot naturally because it lacks a vital ingredient, factor eight. Without regular injections of the clotting factor, he could quite literally bleed to death. But the blessing of factor eight turned into a deadly curse. Everybody wants to shift the blame to somebody else, but no one at the end of the day will accept responsibility. And someone has to be. Someone must be responsible. Someone at some point made a decision. Whether it was knowing the full facts or not, I don't think is important. Uh, someone made a decision and on the strength of that, we should be compensated. Bob Threakle, like Alan White, puts on a brave face. 900 AIDS-infected haemophiliacs are now suing the government for compensation. But we're going beyond the NHS, the suppliers, to the manufacturers of Factor 8. In 85, I was called into the hospital and told that a test had shown that I was positive HIV, AIDS, as I think they called it then. Um, and that was it, basically. There wasn't much else they could tell me at the time. And, and initially, it didn't really mean an awful lot. It was only later when we began to find out exactly what HIV AIDS was, the implications of it. The fact that it's had, in effect, shortened my life from normal to maybe five or six years at the most. You know, that was absolutely devastating. Absolutely devastating. Whose product were you taking? Whose Factor 8 was it? My records show that I was given Armour Factor 8. These are Bob's medical records, with the date of every treatment and the batch numbers which show the factor eight that gave him AIDS, just like Alan, was made by Armour. We followed the trail to Kankakee in the United States, to the Armour Pharmaceutical Company, where the factor eight was made. At this plant, not far from Chicago, Armour produces Factor 8, a product designed to allow haemophiliacs to live something approaching a normal life. Unfortunately, the Factor 8 produced by Armour and several other American companies was contaminated with the AIDS virus. Tonight, we reveal how Armour in particular ignored warnings, ignored some of its own research, persisted in using inadequate safety standards, and continued to sell a product they knew was unsafe and could have killed the very people it was designed to cure. Today, this new NHS plant at Elstree makes 70% of Britain's Factor 8. But in the early 80s, when most haemophiliacs were infected by Factor 8, 70% was imported by four big American companies. Armour was the biggest. Armour Pharmaceutical Company has redefined the process by closing the loop, bringing all stages under the... Armour now boasts about closing the loop, their guarantee that in 1990, Factor 8 is free from contamination, a process which starts with healthy, infection-free donors. From donor to finished product. 
But in the early 1980s, American blood companies were buying blood plasma from intravenous drug users, prostitutes and homosexuals, the very donors most likely to carry blood infections. The risks of passing on hepatitis B were well known by then, and there was mounting evidence that AIDS was also transmitted in blood. When AIDS claimed its first British haemophiliac victim in 1983, the issue was raised in Parliament. Kenneth Clark, then Minister for Health, said there was no conclusive evidence that AIDS was transmitted by blood products. But Edwina Curry said whoever wrote that answer for Kenneth Clark needs his head examined. Whatever the minister knew or didn't know, back in the USA, the blood companies were far better informed than they cared to admit. Secret company documents show that behind closed doors they held meetings at which the risks from donors were fully discussed and apparently ignored. By January of 1983, they were made aware of the significance of um, the correlation between those people who got AIDS and those people who got hepatitis. They were the same types of people the same risk group members, the people who used IV drugs, the people who um, were homosexuals, the prostitutes in the inner city. Well, those were the precise people who the blood industry had been relying upon for their product. The Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta. By 1983, scientists working here for the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, were certain that AIDS was being transmitted, like hepatitis, in the blood supply. They advocated and the blood industry ignored a simple test that would have screened out 90% of the high-risk donors likely to be carrying either disease. And the CDC in January 83, a guy got up on the table, a man named Don Francis, and pounded on the table and said something to the effect, how many people have to die before you start testing? Give me a number so that when that number's reached, we can reconvene and get a consensus on testing. Right? He was so firmly convinced that they could do something right then and there to stop this, um, I guess uh, you might, some people even call it murder going on. They said, well, let's just assume that someday in the future you folks will accept that there's transfusion-associated AIDS. When we reach that number, what are we going to do? That didn't work very well, so by that time I was slamming my fist on the desk saying, uh, aren't we going to do anything or are we just going to leave? And apparently we all just left. How many people would have to die, he was saying? Yes, I, I was like, just, how many cases do you need? How many AIDS cases do you need? If you have six you don't like, will it be 26 or 36? Knowing they were going to come, then we wouldn't have to repeat. I think my line was, we will not have to repeat this unpleasant meeting. At the California Department of Health Services, Dr. Don Francis now runs the state's campaign against AIDS. He has bitter memories of the way the blood companies reacted in 1983 when he urged them to adopt testing procedures to help stop AIDS. They certainly felt from that famous or infamous January meeting that, the, uh, that we were in the minority. Uh, at CDC, where we felt that there was truly an, enough epidemiologic data. We didn't have the virus, obviously, uh, at that time, but there was enough epidemiologic data to look very strongly that there was an infectious agent and it was transmissible by blood. They, on the other hand, uh, felt, at least at that meeting, that uh, made the clear consensus from their side that they were not convinced that there was such a thing as a transmissible agent that caused AIDS. Although they told the government they weren't convinced, confidential papers reveal that privately the companies were well aware of the dangers. Cutter, another big blood company, proposed in December 1982 that an AIDS warning be included in every Factor VIII package because litigation is inevitable. No such warning was given for another two years. And armor management conceded that AIDS was probably a transmissible disease found in all blood products. Company documents that we've uh, managed to get hold of show that they knew that AIDS was highly likely to be transmissible by blood in December 1982. How do you react to that? If they believed what we were presenting at that January meeting then, and then proceeded to go on and market products that they thought were dangerous. I think that's horrible. 
These people had a choice. I wasn't given a choice. I wasn't told what the choice was. You know, you can take factor eight, but it may lead to. Or you can go back to the old system and have your bed rest, which was painful, but it didn't give me HIV. Tom Drees, as the former chief executive of one of the major blood companies, tell me, when did the industry first know it had a real problem with AIDS in the blood supply? Well, I knew at, uh, when the CDC made a presentation at an ABRA meeting in November, the first week of November in 1982, but I subsequently have found out that others knew uh, back into 1982, as early as June and, and perhaps before that. With firm medical evidence of the links in high-risk groups between hepatitis and AIDS, it seemed to Tom Drees that careful donor selection was then the only possible way of increasing safety margins. It was certainly better than nothing, which was the response of his rivals in the other blood companies. We decided to do the only thing we could do, which was to screen donors, uh, not by any test, because there was no test available yet, but by simply by asking them if they were in one of the three high-risk groups and trusting that they would tell us the truth. I mean, it wasn't very much, but it was all we could do. And what did your competitors do when you started to take these measures? Well, they criticized us. Uh, they said it was going to cause a big stir and uh, it wasn't going to be very effective and that if we rejected a donor because of the uh, of his admission of being one of the three uh, high-risk groups that the donor could walk out of our donor center, walk down the street, walk in their center, and they would readily take him, and that we were being fools to do that. But we felt that uh, it was the only thing that we knew to do at that point. It also means, does it not, that they knew they were inevitably going to sell a dangerous product? I think so, but their, their philosophy was that if the FDA doesn't make us do something, then we can do anything that they don't forbid, and I think that was wrong. Still worse was the company's first positive and very cynical response to the problem. At a secret meeting between the companies, Armour's Mike Rodell proposed a task force to study the testing procedure, although the FDA had already told them it would screen out 90% of high-risk donors. In their own words, this task force was nothing more than a delaying tactic, presumably to avoid damaging sales and the increased cost of testing. Even a year into the absolute necessity, practically a year and a half now, of cleaning up the blood supply, these people are still holding on with their fingernails to their profits. They still would not concede to test and the best they would do was present a delaying tactic. They would, they would throw up a smoke screen and make it look like, oh yes, we're really looking into this issue. But in reality, it was just a delaying tactic so they could sell more of their product. And you're saying Armour was a leading force in that? Oh yes, I'm, I'm certain of it. Are you really saying that Armour deliberately delayed tests, deliberately sold an unsafe product they knew could have killed people? Without a doubt. Without a doubt. And if we were to tell you that the company and others knew there was a problem, a serious problem, and had connived together, I think that's the right word, mm. to institute delaying tactics till they got their house in order, how would you feel about that? I'd be absolutely appalled because, I mean, what they've done now is sentence people like me to death by... by delaying whatever they delayed, tests or whatever it was. You know, I, I'd be outraged. It's absolutely incredible. You know, they've obviously taken many, many thousands of people's lives in their hands purely for financial gain. You know, I think it's totally immoral. We showed Bob the documents which proved that the blood companies led by Armour had indeed used delaying tactics to avoid testing and to carry on selling. Well, words fail me. It's absolutely sh diabolical that they put presumably profit before my life. Yeah, they were sitting around the table quibbling about money while we were injecting Bob with live AIDS virus. Yeah, which they knew about. And which they provided. That's yeah, it's inhuman. It's absolutely appalling that they should even contemplate doing something like that. It really is. And do they know what they've done? <sighs> I don't know. What Armour could have done is now being done in Britain. 
At Elstree, British-made Factor 8 is pasteurised to kill the AIDS virus. It's heat-treated for 72 hours at 82 degrees. In New York in 1984, leading virologist Dr. Alfred Prince was commissioned by Armour to test the company's own heat treatment process 30 hours at 60 degrees. It became clear that heating in the dry state uh, at 60 degrees for 30 hours was marginally effective, but much more effective were longer times of heating and higher temperatures. I think that the manufacturers who used that were quite comfortable at the time that they had a process that was okay. But on the basis of those tests, would you have taken, had you needed it, factor eight, heat treated for 60, 30? I would have chosen a more rigorous process, of course. But when he told Armour that his tests showed their heat treatment didn't kill all the AIDS virus, they discounted his research and ordered him not to publish the results. They went ahead with their inadequate 30-hour, 60-degree process instead. It was typical that they tried to use the, the, the lowest heat treatment that they could use uh, in the hopes that that would do the job. Uh, rather than going to something that would be more effective but would, would reduce the yield and therefore damage their profits. Birmingham Children's Hospital saw the first act of the inevitable tragedy that followed. Three haemophiliac youngsters given Armour's heat-treated factor eight were infected with the AIDS virus. As Dr. Prince had warned, Armour's heat treatment wasn't effective. The company's UK license was revoked and its factor eight withdrawn from the British market. But in North America, Armour continued to sell the same kind of unsafe factor eight. The next AIDS victims were in Canada. Seven haemophiliacs have now hired Philadelphia lawyer Wayne Spivey to sue Armour for negligence. When the British AIDS cases developed, they had hard evidence that their heat treatment process was ineffective. And yet it was another seven or eight months before uh, its product in Canada caused uh, the AIDS cases, which I'll so style the Canadian AIDS cases. And it was even another few months after that before the product was withdrawn worldwide. The important uh, other consideration is that during a period of time, while they had their low heat treat process, I'll call it on the market, they also had changed their process into the higher heat treat process and marketed both at the same time. Though they knew that the lower heat treat process, or at least we claim in our case they knew, was ineffective and not a safe product. And yet, as you say, they still continued to sell what they knew was an inadequate and possibly dangerous product. As we claim in our case, they did it in the UK and they did it in Canada. Of course, they also did it in this country. That's clearly unacceptable in, in the health care. You have to, not to, in any other industry also, you would never do that kind of a thing for either to an individual or for your company. It does not fit with logic or ethical behavior. It's wrong. Yet they did it, and they did it. This is a memorial to Terry Toussignon, and ironically, in a way, it's also a monument to the biggest mistake ever made by Armour and other major blood companies. We're in a cemetery just outside Kankakee, where, remember, Armour makes Factor 8. Terry was a haemophiliac who worked for Armour for nine years, until, as his father believes, he contracted AIDS from Armour's own product and shot himself in the head. Terry's brother Chuck, also a haemophiliac, also took the armor product and died of AIDS itself. The human tragedy of the whole affair couldn't have struck closer to home. Yeah, he called me up and he told me what he was going to do and uh, he said he loved us and, uh, and he warned me to tell Jennifer not to Call her until he was gone, and he said, Dad, by the time you get here, I'll be gone. And so he was gone. He took a massive blow to the, to the head with a shotgun. Somebody's guilty of something. Could be negligence, it could be not knowing what they were doing, and 
Maybe they didn't. Maybe they didn't want her to do it. Well, for what motive? Profit? Profit. Money. That's what this country's built on. We asked Armour three times to comment on their leading role in the Factor 8 scandal, but three times they refused. We wanted to speak to Michael Riddell, the company's vice president in charge of scientific affairs, the man also in charge of this billion dollar industry's delaying tactics. We met Dr. Riddell outside Armour's corporate headquarters in Philadelphia. Good morning, Dr. Riddell. Roger Cook from Central Television. What have you got to say uh, to Britain's haemophiliacs, many of whom feel your product poisoned? Why have you no answers, Dr. Riddell? Don't you care what's happened to people who took your product or your company's product in good faith? How do you feel about that, Dr. Riddell? What's the point of the picture, Dr. Riddell? Well, I'd like to show him exactly what he's done to me. I mean, he's deprived me of a continuing lifestyle. Why not answer some he's questions? deprived my child, children actually, because I've got three sons of their father. Have you he will have deprived them of their father at, at some stage. Deprived my wife of a husband. He's given me an enormous amount of worry and concern. You know, I'd like to just point out to him exactly what he's done. You know, was it worth it? Did he enjoy his money at the time? I think the actual legal terminology of negligence or homicide has to be decided by the courts. But from my personal view, it's horrendous that you would pass on a deadly virus and actually lead to fatal injury of someone from a product that you're, that you're marketing. Terrible. Illogical. Unwise. Inhumane. Unethical. Terrible. Well, I'll say goodbye, Terry, and I'll come and see you again, okay? In the name of the Father, and Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. In Birmingham, Gary Corns lives every day with the terrible consequences of what he has done. Armour Factor 8 gave him the AIDS virus. Now he's passed it on to girlfriend Lee and little Christopher, too. Before Lee, Gary had been married, and after he'd tested positive, his ex-wife had a child. Both remain AIDS-free, so Gary and Lee took the risk and lost. I feel murder. I'm a murderer. I've, I've killed her life. I, you know, it's something I've felt very, very bitter about for, well, since she, I'd found out that she was, a, you know, until she was seven months pregnant, because I thought she would have been okay through that. And it's only when she was tested during the pregnancy that it, it, it cut me up quite a lot, you see, and I've no endless of times I've told her that I'm sorry, but she, she's took it to heart, she, she understands. And there's, I have to live every day with her now and just hope to God nothing happens to her. It's the worst thing of all, you know, we haven't had a life first. We've got it, I mean, we're still young. I mean, they've killed her, like a whole family, God knows how many more. And I mean, they've just wiped us out. So far, the government has paid 1,200 haemophiliacs £20,000 each in hardship money. Now most are suing for compensation. But how do you compensate someone like Lee for losing 50 years of life? Or little Christopher for losing 70? So more of the victims who are still alive and can still afford it may turn to suing armour. It's uh, inside I'm cut up, bitter. It's uh, especially now that I know that it was armour products that... Uh, did um, infect me with the HIV. Um, I feel that they should have to pay. You know, they, sh they should do something. It's no good them uh, taking their time about things because by the time they do decide to do something, there's going to be a load more, a load more hemophiliacs who are going to die. And it, it's, it's, it's not right. It's not fair. It's, it's injustice. We should have something now.